Welcome to the Mountain West AETC Project Echo. I'm Kent Unruh and I'd like to turn it over to our speaker for the talk today. Well, I was actually looking forward to doing a back and forth with you, but Brian asked me to do a basic talk on the evidence as it exists for PrEP for monogamous and serodiscordant couples, because as Brian said, this question comes up quite a lot and there really isn't a clear answer, which we'll get to at the end. So I've given you the punchline. So what we're gonna talk about is treatment as prevention. And I'll show you data from HPTN, HIV Prevention Trials Network Study 052, and a little bit of other data that is increasing as we move forward. Talking about PrEP as a bridge for HIV positive partners starting antiretroviral therapy. A little bit about cost effectiveness data with all of the caveats about cost effectiveness studies. We'll talk a little bit about other things that you might consider, whether to prescribe PrEP for the HIV negative partner in a monogamous serodiscordant couple. I'll share with you the official guidelines, and then we'll wrap up with recommendations and suggestions. So first, I think this is a really great example of this, this tug of war, this slide that I often show in these talks about the tension between sort of public health and us as providers to individuals and how we try to reconcile this tension that exists. And the slide that I like to show is an analysis from the IPREC study, which for those of you who don't remember was the initial PrEP study that reported results in 2010 that was 24 and 99 men and transgender women who have sex with men that was done in the United States, in South America, and in South Africa. And this was analysis that was done by Susan Buckbinder from San Francisco looking at characteristics of the individuals who acquired HIV in the IPREX study. And what we have on this figure on the x-axis is the population attributable fraction. That is the proportion of individuals who acquired HIV during the study who reported any one of these factors. And on the y-axis, we have the number needed to treat. Fewer people needed to treat is generally more cost-effective. Higher population attributable fraction means you're gonna capture all of the individuals. And so what we have here, I don't have, I only have one slide, so I don't have my other box, but out on the right are the behaviors reported by the majority of individuals who acquired HIV. And those included a receptive anal intercourse without a condom with a partner of unknown zero status or actually all partners was the highest. But when we get to sort of thinking about sort of public health and cost effectiveness and directing our interventions most effectively, we're gonna to wanna to focus on the number needed to treat. And in this study, the characteristic reported that had the lowest number needed to treat was cocaine use. And Vanessa McMahon, who is the research coordinator for the IPREX study, who is currently working with me, likes to tell me that the reason for why cocaine is showing up on here is that the majority of the infections happened in South America, and the majority of stimulant use in South America is cocaine and not methamphetamine. And so I use this slide to talk about methamphetamine as a surrogate for sort of targeting to the lowest number needed to treat. But you can see other characteristics here. And so again, how do you figure out who you're going to prescribe to? And what you can see here in us also sort of relatively low is receptive sex without a condom with a HIV positive partner. But what this doesn't account for is HIV treatment. And so we know treatment as prevention works. And we had long history of observational data suggesting that the lower your HIV level, the less likely you were to transmit but really HPT and 052 was a landmark study which proved that treatment works as prevention. And it's a really busy slide provided to me by my Cohen, who was the PI on HPT and 052. And really the sort of the, the bullet is that in this study of discordant couples who were randomized either to immediate treatment or to delayed treatment based on a CD4 count initiated threshold, that initiating antiretroviral therapy immediately was associated with a 93% reduction in the likelihood of HIV transmission. That is assuming that all of the partners are linked. And so in that arm, it was actually a 69% reduction overall, but the fact is that many HIV negative individuals acquired HIV from individuals who are not their HIV positive primary partner. So when you include only linked transmissions, we again, we go to that as 93% 
you can sort of go into the data in a little bit more detail and say who were the people who either transmitted or acquired HIV from their partners when their partner was on anti antiretroviral therapy, supposedly, and it was either individuals who they estimate the partner was not yet suppressed after starting antiretroviral therapy, or the person had had either treatment interruption or virologic failure. And so I think many people have really said this is just a, an estimate, but in reality, what we are seeing is very close to 100% protection. And Brian asked me to add in this slide looking at the partner study, which was a, stu is, was a study of couples, and there is partner two, which is of men of sex with men is ongoing. And then also Jared Baton, who works at the University of Washington in their cohort study, have documented thousands and thousands of sex acts among thousands and thousands of HIV discordant couples and identified no transmissions. However, there is one case that is reported in the literature of an individual who supposedly was undetectable at the time of transmission to his partner. And what I'm showing you is this, the documentation as it existed. And in the figure on the left, you'll see viral load in this dark line, CD4 count in the dotted line. And so this is the HIV positive patient was started on Combivir and Efavirenz. You can see this is in 2001. So our antiretroviral therapy is gonna be different than what it is now. But the patient was suppressed and undetectable really quite consistently for a period of years. And then his partner acquired HIV, and I don't remember off the top of my head why they narrowed it down to this period of time. I think it was probably his HIV testing results, but you can see that during this, in this gray box, the patient, the HIV positive patient remained completely undetectable. And so the first question is, of course, you know, maybe he acquired, like all those other patients in HPTN052 from a different partner, and they did phylogenetic analyses, which really all I want you to focus on is this red box, which is the index patient and his partner are grouped together compared to many other sequences. So it was a pretty clear transmission from an HIV-positive individual who we presume was suppressed at the time of transmission to his partner. But this is the one case. And so there's a lot of interest in sort of promoting treatment as prevention and saying undetectable equals untransmissible. And sort of I, I always, just like PrEP is not 100% protective, treatment as prevention is not 100%. But how do we couch that message in a way that number one, promotes treatment as prevention, and number two, it doesn't overestimate this risk again, one patient. And so there's good evidence that from 052 that patients who are starting antiretroviral therapy are still potentially infectious and that there is a period of time in which we may choose to cover H their HIV negative partners with PrEP. And there was a really nice demonstration partner again run by Jared Baton here from the University of Washington that was done in Kenya and Uganda called the Partners Demonstration Project. And it was an open label prospective interventional study of integrating antiretroviral therapy and PrEP for HIV prevention in those heterosexual, again, that's a key caveat, heterosexual HIV discordant couples. And the goal was to use implementation science and do PrEP and antiretroviral therapy in a scalable delivery system. It was done between 2012 and 2016, and I presented this when we talked about the last international AIDS conference. So these are the same slides from there, and I could not find it published at this point. But in the top of this figure, what you can see is for individuals, they have discordant couples, HIV positive person not on therapy at the time, HIV negative person at risk from their partner. They started antiretroviral therapy for the HIV positive individual and PrEP at the same time and continued PrEP in the HIV negative individual for six months after the HIV positive individual remained suppressed, as long as the HIV positive partner continued to be on antiretroviral therapy. But they stopped PrEP in the HIV negative person at that time. For their partners in which there were other issues, the partner didn't want to start on antiretroviral therapy, there was problems with continued antiretroviral therapy, they continued PrEP during this period of time. And this strategy is thought to be cost-effective by mathematical modeling. And so their results are as expected, so based on general risk in discordant couples, this was not observed in their trial because everyone initiated therapy, they expected there to be 83 infections with an incidence rate of 4.9 per 100 person years. What they saw were four infections, which I'll show you details on the next slide, which they calculated as a 95% reduction in HIV incidence using the strategy of HIV treatment for the positive person, 
PrEP for the negative person until the HIV positive person had been suppressed for six months. These four infections in the group included basically partners who were not actually taking their PrEP or HIV positive partners who were not actually taking their antiretroviral therapy. Not, not surprising, and none had resistance to either of the components of PrEP. So I just want to bring forward, there's, there's a lot of movement to promote this idea that undetectable equals untransmittable. It decreases stigma among people living with HIV, and it's really been taken up both domestically and internationally. And I just want to loop back for those of you who've been doing this for a while about the Swiss statement. The Swiss statement was an accidental publication of a recommendation in 2008 that said that in discordant partnerships where the positive partner was undetectable, it had no STIs, that they stated that there is no risk of HIV transmission. And there was a huge hullabaloo at the time, and people thought that Again, this was not intended to, to be publicized, but people thought that this was dangerous. We didn't have the data, and I now just think, you know, we're 10 years later, and they're thinking, see, we told you so. Mm-hmm. But again, one case, again, not 100%. I think the real question is, what is the cost effectiveness of the strategy? Again, going thinking back to that, that tug of war between trying to get every single person who's at risk for HIV with really where should we be spending our resources. And I apologize for this complicated slide. It's from a manuscript from Chen and Dowdy from PLOS One from a few years ago. And the things I want to point out are just so if you look at the top, the base case scenario, we'll talk a little bit about the assumptions, including the fact that based on IPRAX, which had a modified intent to treat hazard reduction of 44%, again, 44%, that there were number needed to treat, we're going to go back to that number, number needed to treat was 64, and the cost per quality gained was 160,000, which is over what we really consider to be cost effective in terms of our other screening, our screening activities like cancer screenings and things like that. So I usually think of 100,000 just because it's a simple number for me to remember. But obviously every country is different, every situation is different. But if you talk about high adherers, so again, PrEP only works if you take it, with a relative risk reduction of 92%, then you get a cost per quality of 3,000, which is very cost effective. And if you target it to high risk individuals where the prevalence is huge, 35%, with high adherence, getting your efficacy of 92%, it is cost saving. Everybody likes to be cost saving. And so here, this is the, the section that I want you to focus on where they estimated cost effectiveness in monogamous and serodiscordant couples. And they don't say it in the table, but they assume that the HIV positive individual is on treatment that we get to PrEP having a cost effectiveness of $280,000 per quality gain, which is not cost effective. And then you look at some of the assumptions in terms of risk. And what I'm pointing out is just they assumed that the relative risk of antiretroviral therapy in decreasing the risk of transmission, it was a 91% decrease. Not sure where they got that number from, but did some cost effectiveness analyses associated with that. So again, if you assume that the effectiveness of treatment as prevention is even higher than 91%, it's going to be even less cost effective because you will have to treat more people in order to prevent one case of HIV infection. So Assuming that individuals who are positive are on treatment and are suppressed, it is PrEP is not cost effective. However, there are lots of other things that we think about when we're taking care of patients, individual patients. One is we know that there's a benefit to the partnership in reducing anxiety about transmission within that discordant couple. Number two is it, it gives control of protection to that HIV negative partner. We don't know, he may not know 100%, is his partner reliable about taking his medications? Having virologic failure or not being on your medicines was a risk in HPTN052 for those transmissions. Is your HIV negative partner disclosing to you whether or not they have other partners and other risks? Again, in 052, a, you know, a good number, there's a third of all of those HIV infections happen from partnerships outside of the primary partner. I think there's something to think about in terms of, you know, are we doing this for a short term and can we justify it that way? Is it just for periconception? Is it just for the idea that you're going to give these individuals PrEP, they're going to get used to the idea of not using condoms, which they may have used for years and years and years, and then they might just say, hey, this actually isn't worth it. And then I think the, the thing that we probably don't do enough is refer individuals for couples counseling to talk about these agreements, about anxiety, about the relations, about the relationship in general. So just quickly, I'm just going to show you the, what the CDC recommendations say, which are super broad, which is 
what their goals are. The goals are to capture anyone who might be eligible for PrEP. So in order, and I just am bringing up the men who have sex with men guidelines, to indication for PrEP, you have to be male, HIV negative, have any male sex partners in the last six months, and not in a monogamous relationship with an HIV negative man. But you also have to have anal sex without condoms in the last six months, or an STD diagnosed in the last six months, or in an ongoing sexual relationship with an HIV positive male partner. No, they, they don't say anything about treatment of that partner. They just say, if you're in a relationship and you're having sex without condoms, that PrEP might be right for you. So just to sum up, my practice is that when people come to me and they're in monogamous discordant couples, where the HIV positive individual is on PrEP, I reassure them about the low risk in this situation, but at least I am still willing to prescribe PrEP to that HIV negative individual, again, because there's the benefit for the HIV negative individual to take control and because it's really treating the relationship. But I also, when people are talking about how to target PrEP, I think that although the these relationships and partnerships are the easiest to target because you have the HIV positive individual. You can say, hey, is your partner on PrEP? They're not the highest risk, and I wouldn't necessarily focus a lot of energy in your organization about trying to find those partnerships. So I think that's my last slide.